It's Monday the 11th of December 2023 and welcome to this special Water Action Platform broadcast. Now this month's broadcast is special for so many reasons. It's the end of the year. It's our 59th broadcast. We're holding it on an unusual day, the second Monday of the month rather than the third Thursday. Why, you might ask? Well, it's because we have a special COP28 broadcast. Now, this broadcast is actually being recorded on the evening of Sunday the 10th, because today, Sunday, is the last full official day of the COP. And today there have been detailed discussions about food, agriculture and, drumroll please, water. We have had a man on the ground in Dubai attending COP28 for the past few days, Dr Ben Tam, the chief executive of Isle. And in a few minutes, I'm going to connect with him live to get his direct straight from the conference floor feedback. But before we do, I want to do two things. Firstly, I want to thank our lovely sponsors because without them, we wouldn't be here. Secondly, it's worth taking a minute or two to look at the pros and cons. Shall we call them the highlights and lowlights of the COP so far. Now on the positive side, a loss and damage fund has been agreed. This happened on day one and was hailed as a hard won victory for developing countries. The counter to this is that that funding pledged a tasty 700 million US dollars is estimated to be less than 0.2% of the approximately 500 billion that's going to be needed. Now combine that with the fact that the COP president, Sultan al Jaba, a man who works for the state-owned oil company, has made the ridiculous and incorrect statement that there is no science that supported the claim that fossil fuel needs to be phased out. This at a COP when many had hoped there would be global agreement on the end of use, end use of fossil fuels. Now, the COP has attracted many world leaders, so hopefully that means they take it seriously. King Charles opened the event with a stirring speech. My own UK Prime Minister deigned to turn up, apparently so he could defend his retreat on climate policies. Biden sent the vice president, but Colombia's president referred to the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty as suicide for his country. And Russia? Well, Putin turned up apparently to stir up tensions over the Israel-Gaza conflict. Now it is with that background that we now go live to the UAE to hear from Ben Tam, Chief Executive for Isle. Now Ben has spent the last few days attending the COP discussions. Ben, are you there? I'm here, Wonderful Bruce. to see you, Ben. Oh, good. It's so good when the technology <laughs> works like this. Well, let's jump straight in. Um, what's it like being at an event with 97,000 people? Tell me about the logistics, the buzz. How do you find your room, your food, all of that stuff? Well, it actually started before, long before you get here to even just try and find a hotel room, there's places to stay anywhere near the venue. And anyone who's been to Dubai in the last few years knows it continues to sprawl. And actually, the site is the Expo City, built in 2020, which was there to sort of advertise the world and, and plant the UAE in place. And actually, it's, it's pretty well set up to accommodate that number of people, notwithstanding huge numbers of queues, bag checks, discrepancies with tickets, you know, your, the ways to get in. But once you're inside there, it's a massive place and you, you spend your first few, probably most of the days you are there, just trying to figure out where things are and just asking friendly security guards which way you're going. But it's got a buzz to it, I assume. I mean, it's that's the bit which really took me off guard, really, is that on one hand, I've been reading all the headlines and you can feel quite negative about the parts there. But there is a real buzz, especially around the green zone part. There's a lot of different activities. And what I think was heartening from it is that actually the public can get to most of those parts as well. So if you're a speaker, you have different levels, but the public come in. So you, you don't really know who's going to attend parts of these sessions at times. There's a real mix and I think that that's got to be a good thing right this is when we're having proper discussions with everybody from the public and, and who are the attendees is it world leaders or is it lobbyists or is it consultants supply chain all of the above well it's definitely all of the above you get a lot of the ministerial side but they get their their black Audis who take them through to one side of the entrance and they, they all get in there definitely feels like you've got a, a lobbyist group across here in, in that respect You've got a lot of the, the sort of the corporate world here who, you know, are here for lots of reasons. On one hand, you can say it's great that they've all turned up to, to try and be involved with climate discussions. On the other hand, you have to sort of make sure you're listening to the right voices in there. 
Uh, but then you're getting a lot of, you know, it's been quashed slightly, but there have been open platforms for um, not the, the act, more activist side. So people voicing dissent or okay. people coming through. So we've had some, in, some, some real indigenous marches going through. So people are sort of really thinking about indigenous rights to land and really creating quite a colourful atmosphere on the back of that around parts of COP. And I think perhaps that doesn't come through on the TV oh, brilliant. as well as it does well, here. Yeah, the media isn't telling us anything of that. It, it is just focusing on some of the, the more negative bits. And, and today, let's talk about today, because today I've seen the programme. It was about food, water and agriculture. And I saw that there were lots of parallel sessions. And you mentioned that there's a blue zone. So uh, I assume there must be other coloured zones. Um, how, does it, how does that work? And how did you choose which, which places you went to? Well, so the blue zone is where the, so the, the high level discussions and uh, the ministers discuss, but you also have uh, you, uh, representation from governments, corporates and that's on that side. But on the green zone side is also where they have a lot of the events. So you get a, a big mix between the two, but the green zone is more open, less restricted. Uh, so today actually I spent a lot of time around the startup village because they've got a big amphitheatre around there and actually in one of the technology hubs. So really trying to listen in on new technologies coming forward, but both from an agricultural water perspective, which, you know, there's a lot of things going on on that side, which are people are trying to bring forward. And what I found most interesting from it was actually the discussions you got from the, the public asking questions around you know, precision farming and will that actually make a difference in terms of uh, pesticides? Will it make a difference in terms of the quality of crops we're going to get? Is it going to reduce water? And it was really catching people off guard, I think, in terms of maybe the level of questions they were potentially used to. And then you come in with some technical person who's really, really listening to some of the science and then thinking that way. So I felt like that really stretched presenters and it made people talk and it made be a language which was much more understandable to your, your average conference. Excellent. I hope the media picks up on that. Now, tell me about um, what are the key takeaways from the water water part? Well, so it's split over a few zones, so, but the things I picked up on were that there's a 150 million climate fund being put up in the UAE and that's going to be around, some of that money is going to be dedicated towards the water side. So they are, there's been, even on the energy transition zone I was in today, listening to Taka, who are one of the big operators out here, they were talking about atmospheric water generation and that the technologies are going down that route. Um, but also then what the next generation of that would be in terms of topping up their water supply on that front. Uh, it was great to see one of the technologies from the Trial Reservoir, Permolution, also being presented into that space, which is, a, I think, a great sort of step up. So, you know, the world for us, you know, that's, that's bread and butter for us here on the Water Action Platform. But knowing that's out there and the wider world being talked about, I thought was really interesting for us. The second was actually listening to data, Johan um, Rauken who is the commissioner for the economics of water, you know, the global commission for the economics of water. And he was talking today and the real strong statement you might see out there was that he was saying that to get to one point below 1.5 degrees C, it's not about the reduction only in fossil fuels and phasing them out, it's investments in water. And he gave like a really coherent set of arguments about why we should really raise this up the agenda. And if we can try and amplify a few of those probably through the social media side on that front, I think that will probably get to other people's minds that investment in water is an investment in climate. And I think that's probably one of the strongest messages we could take out. Brilliant. Oh, well, excellent. Excellent. My my hope is being restored here. And I love the fact that you mentioned permula permulation. Per, uh, perm. <laughs> Um, I, I can't find my brain. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, because we're actually about to hear from um, what a pre-recorded trial, uh, a pre-recorded segment um, about the trial reservoir that's done. So let's take a short break and let's hear from Joe Burgess talking about a trial reservoir trial that is being done at COP28. Over to Joe. Thank you, Piers. Yes, we now come to a trial reservoir update. You may remember that the trial reservoir is a reservoir of money. It's a pool of money that we are giving to the world to be used as a revolving loan fund to support trials for climate change mitigating technologies. Two of the trials are being showcased at COP28. You'll hear more during next month's Water Action Platform, but for today we're focused on just one, desalinator. And what, I hear you ask, is desalinator? 
This is the world's first circular solar thermal desalination system. And who better to explain what that means than one of the founders himself? A couple of weeks ago, during the run-up to COP28, my friend and colleague Nada Abubakar met with Alexei Levine to talk about it and what it's got to do with COP28. Hi everyone, my name is Nada Abubakar and I'm sitting here with Alexei Levine, who is the co-founder and chief commercial officer of Desolinator. Now, Alexei, can you tell us a bit more about uh, Desolinator? Sure. Well, the first thing now there is to understand that in the world today, the desalination industry is one of the fastest growing bits of the water industry. And that's because for many parts of the world, desalination, so transforming seawater into drinking water, is the only solution. And the problem with desalination today is that it's an incredibly carbon intensive industry. So a lot of fossil fuels, there's logistics around water, the movement of water, et cetera. And then also in the desalination process, a lot of chemicals are used that end up in a brine that goes back into the sea and the ocean. So it's a very fast growing industry, but it has some intrinsic issues around sustainability and our oceans uh, that Desolinator is looking to take on and disrupt. So Alexa, you, you've spoken about uh, decarbonization, disruption of, uh, of the current desalination sector. Can you tell us a bit more about how do you use, use that or how do you do that? Yes, absolutely, Nada. So the, the philosophy of desalinator is predicated on three things. First of all, to harvest as much energy as we possibly can from abundant resources like the sun, um, uh, to have as low as possible operating costs and ease of use as possible so the system can last for a long time, and then to completely eliminate uh, waste, liquid waste, brine, chemical filled brine going back into the sea. The energy side, we've designed our own panels. And in our panels, we don't, we, we not only get the 15% of electrical energy that you normally would have from solar PV, we actually harvest an additional 45% of thermal energy from the same panels. So we get 60% of efficiency on our panels. Um, that means we can run our system uh, by uh, storing uh, energy as hot water in a thermal battery. Uh, we can run our system 24 hours a day off-grid from solar energy alone. Uh, we can tie to the grid, but we can be off-grid from solar energy. And then in our system, because we don't have any uh, membranes, pre-treatment, post-treatment chemicals, any energy required that's all free in our system for 20 years, uh, that means that there are no moving parts. So actually, as a system to be installed in a place that may be difficult to, to operate, you may, you know, maintenance can be a real issue, but actually we've created a system that is as low maintenance and as low OPEX as possible. And the third thing is on the brine. Because we don't use any harmful chemicals in this process, our brine is relatively clean. And what we're now building is the ability to recirculate this brine through our system. So we ultra concentrate it from solar energy, and then we crystallize it and make salt, and nothing goes back into the environment. Can you tell us a bit more on the plans going forward for uh, Desolinator at COP28? Yeah, so uh, COP28 is really a unique moment in time uh, for Desolinator and for all of us uh, in many ways. Of course, the measure of success is that there won't be a COP29, um, but, uh, you know, we, we do what we can. And um, for Desolinator COP28, we are going to be participating in the Blue Zone, uh, giving a number of talks, uh, not only on uh, the water food nexus and agriculture, but also talking about oceans and how to do ocean safe desalination. Uh, we have a number of activations with our partners and um, we're very proud that on the 7th of December, it's a free day during the COP, we're bringing a number of very senior delegations to come and visit the plant we've delivered for Silal uh, and to come and see our system and also hopefully to eat some tomatoes from uh, the greenhouse. This is an opportunity to drive uh, capital that's needed and not only capital uh, for going to corporations and so on, but actually Capital for climate justice, you know, the, the, there's so many parts of the world, are, uh, most of the world is affected by climate change now, today, 
um, isn't necessarily the developed countries and so on. So, you know, it's actually not only about uh, addressing the problem and measuring carbon saved and phase three and all this kind of stuff, but it's, it's actually about how does someone on the ground, whether they're in Bangladesh or Philippines or one of the low-lying uh, Caribbean islands, uh, you know, who are facing real existential crisis today, how can this uh, COP actually help them in real terms? And I think the degree to which that question is answered is the degree to which we can say this has been a successful COP. Thank you both, Nada and Alexei. We'll be back with Desalinator during January's Water Action Platform. It will be a Tri Reservoir special, and we'll look at more detail on the results from Abu Dhabi. But that's next month. And for me, the standout message for today is Alexei's statement that if COP28 works, we won't need a COP29. That's exactly what I think we should all be working towards. Now, let's go back to Piers. Thank you, Joe. Now, before we return to Ben in Dubai to hear about the actual results and outcomes and good, bad, ugly from COP28, I wanted to share with you this image, which has been doing the rounds on social media. Now, it's taken from the COP28 session held on December the 5th, which was entitled Responsible Yachting, and Alexi referred to, uh, referred to it earlier. Of course, this is an important topic. Marine pollution from sailing vessels is not insignificant, but the Why Catamarans title in this photo can't help but elicit a smile. Does this simply enhance the view that COP28 is just for the super rich, or does COP28 actually have an impact on the rest of us? So with that in mind, let's go back to Ben. Now, Ben, I, hopefully you, you heard that video where um, with uh, Alexi and Nada from Desolinator. Um, I'd love to hear your, your sort of yeah. summary of the good, bad, ugly. Uh, what are you going to take away from COP28? First, I think I've got to take away the energy from being around it. There's definitely a, a a sort of festival vibe around the side of it and interacting with so many different people who are well intentioned to try and learn about something and take it away is a good thing. The second was one of the learnings from the panel, one of the panel sessions I, I was on was really thinking about new in innovations in financing to get mobilising capital, especially from the global north, the global south. Um, I've, I'm a little bit hesitant on the commoditization of the environment in terms of credits. I think there's a kind of a complication there. But I do think. Sorry, what does that mean? Just explain you... that in a bit more. So, for those so, of us. so, yeah. So it's really about how do you take the data from a catchment, and by then focusing on a particular area, say with the utility, could you solve that particular bit of non-revenue water? And turn, if you can do that in the right way, can you sell that as a credit to somebody else who needs it? So okay. you'd have seen from things like Microsoft saying that they had a huge yeah, spike with, in with massive tech. Yeah, yeah, we've yeah. covered that. So how are they going to do it? And so there's this kind of level of like, how do you leverage that? And so like I said, you, you're kind of like, your, your cynic in you starts to go like, well, how is this going to work? But I've, I've been working with a, a bunch of people here and I, I feel that now might be the time where something like that might come together and we can see mobilization of capital, which needs to happen. Someone needs to unlock it somehow. And there's some forward thinking people here who I believe we'll see in the next months going forward. So I'll be working hard on that for them. The other and can I just play you back what I think I've just heard you saying? So this could be that some utilities might be able to outperform some of their targets and reduce down their leakage to even lower than needed and therefore compensate for other utilities that can't reach those targets. Is that essentially what we're saying? Is that or have I oversimplified it? No, it, no, it's actually the other way around. So if you're, say, uh, a, a utility in Ethiopia, if you fix the leaks there, you create the credit that credit can be bought by somebody else who needs to offset what they are doing. So by saving water in that place, but that means you're investing in the infrastructure there in a way which wouldn't get invested in otherwise. And the very simplistic way of doing it is on a, everyone can get their head around a bit of pipe with leaks in it, but there are different permutations of that which can go. And now that's where the data, your mind starts to open up to, well, you know, the last six months, how much data people collected, the AI tools, and you're like, well, this, this could be really possible in the future. So, my mind is now open to that. I think I was more cynical before. I'm now believing that there could be mechanisms there which help us mobilise capital in a new way. And that changes uh, the dynamic. So that's something I've, I, I've I, definitely I learned from since being here. 
this is so good because I don't think we get what you're sharing with us off normal media channels because it's all a bit doom and gloom. I, I think I'm hearing um, about the, the water fund. I'm hearing about these environmental credits, um, the general buzz that's there. OK, what about the bad and ugly? We're doing the good and the bad and the ugly. What goes into the bad and ugly side of things? Well, I think on the bad side, it's very rushed. So you're getting these kind of, you're, you're forced to choose certain discussions, you're forced to pick certain areas and you just can't be involved in everything. So everybody is rushing somewhere. You get these fleeting moments. Imagine you're a big conference you've gone to times a hundred, you know, a hundred thousand person conference, you're rushing. So you feel exhausted of trying to get the information you want from people and meet people. And that's not that you know, fulfilling at times. You feel like you're missing you're out drinking. on something. Drinking from a fire hose in terms of the information. Yeah, I can I can imagine. And the ugly? And the other and ugly, I've got to really say, I'm not a fan of like the electric car sales and the pitching for them around the place. So, you know, the, the world is not going to get better by us driving fancy electric cars. You know, capitalism on that side is not going to work for us. And I could do without that if, you know, if I'm honest around this. But, you know, you have to kind of take the rough with the smooth. So, um, sorry, car manufacturers out there. It's probably not the place for you. Yeah, you know, this means that you're not going to get that free all electric Audi. It's not going to be delivered to your house. That's what that means. Um, what do you think you remember in, in 12 days time or 12 months time? What's your one big takeaway? That a lot of people here are promising to turn talk into action. So people are making pledges. People are in the session saying this is what we are going to do and I, I feel that's the kind of the marker of people wanting to take things further forward so people are trying to build the right networks here to transform it so for me it's about trying to harness that it's really hard to say which particular ones of those to sort of call out on sessions like this but I, you know for me i was really listening hard and especially some of the island nations who are really suffering from climate yeah. change they're really having to reach out and sort of build bridges and sort of bang this drum about, you know, the writing is on the wall here. I, that's the kind of, just that movement. COP for me, I've learnt, and the takeaway I've got is that you need it in the diary just to get the focus. You have the doom and the gloom, but you need, we need it here to, to build up that, that vocabulary about what we're going to do about change. You know, knowing well, about 1.5 degrees, knowing about net zero carbon only really came from this. And it seems a very human, crazy way to put stuff together. But in some ways, we kind of need it in the diary. Now, could it be better and changed? Most probably in all of this. And I, I, the bit which I find hard to read from the outside is the, is the kind of the, the wordsmithing on policy. I think it's quite hard from, it's just, you're just got reading and go, well, what is this? Yeah. Now, I know it's late in the evening for you and thank you for dialing in, but sort of a last question, you you, you sort of alluded to it there, but I, I still want to ask it. This is COP28, it is your first COP. Would you do it again? Would you turn up again? I would. I would, uh, I would go there because, again, if you can connect with the right people, it's like going to a place where the others have flown in together to be there. Granted, that is a carbon footprint to be there, but there's something about the human discussions. More perhaps could do offline on the way to it and making you know, making more of this beforehand, I think. Actually, I think in Azerbaijan, where it's going to be next, it'll probably be less of a, less like it is in Dubai. Dubai has a certain feel to it as a, as a yes. place, so it will be slightly different when it's in Azerbaijan, I should imagine. Excellent. Well, Ben, it's been wonderful speaking to you. Have a great night. Thank you for giving that feedback and safe travels home uh, later this week. No problem. And finally, let's continue that vibe of uplifting hope for the future with this short montage of pledges that have been made by people from across the world, many of them Water Action Platform members, who responded to the recent water climate discussion uh, where we were called to make personal pledges. I pledge to help fight climate change by buying less new items and more second-hand items. And I pledge never again to use tap water to water any of my plants, be them in the house or in the garden. I pledge to support and vote for the campaigners and political parties that I think will be the most effective in tackling climate change challenges. And I pledge to run a parent talk at my kids' school about the importance of water 
within climate change. And our pledge to bring disruptive innovation to life and break boundaries to drive resiliency and sustainability. I pledge to fight disinformation on climate change and to support leaders that are implementing and developing effective climate policy. And I pledge to take climate action by bringing climate action from my professional life into my personal life and influencing those around me to take action as well. And I pledge to save water every day. I pledge to decrease the length and temperature of my showers. I pledge to set my home thermostat at 19 degrees and I pledge to set my hot water tank thermostat at 60 degrees. On behalf of MWH, we pledge to establish a strategy within the next 12 months incorporating our scope 3 emissions, including our supply chain, to achieve net zero ahead of 2050. And I pledge to take showers instead of baths to save water. I pledge to always use a cup while brushing my teeth, as well as to only boil the necessary amount of water that I actually need. And my son and I pledge to reduce our water usage by having shorter showers. And I pledge to develop open source protein, an alternative to water polluting, land grabbing, carbon intensive meat. And I pledge to have a minimal impact Christmas, giving gifts like homemade edible treats or vouchers for experiences and days out. I just absolutely love that. I've got so much pledge envy. I don't know about you. There's so many that I thought, oh, I, I, I want that one. That's the one that's best. That brings us to the end of this special broadcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Next month's Water Action Blog platform, or should I say next year's, will be on Thursday, the 25th of January. Have a great Christmas. Keep asking questions. Keep sharing. And keep safe.